All right, I think we can get started. So welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on and attending this morning's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I'm on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, just a few things to note. Please let me know in the chat if there are any technical issues that I can try to resolve. If you have any questions or comments, please submit them via the Q&A button uh, and we'll address them at the end. Uh, now I'd like to please welcome uh, Jesse Steigerwald, the president of Lexi Her. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Really excited to see people today. Um, just wanted to tell you, I'll circle back at the end to share a little more about the monument project. But Lexi Her is a group in Lexington, Massachusetts, where we're just working to make women visible. It seems very obvious, but um, we know that in many historic places, such as right here in the Battle Green area of Lexington, Massachusetts, women aren't really visible. And part of the joy of the project that 12 of us got together as a steering committee in March of 2020 to do this, um, part of the joy has been discovering untold stories. And I did not know about the amazing woman we're gonna hear about today, but she was nominated by community member here during our 2021 Women's Visibility Banner Project. So at the end, I'll give you some updates about the project this year. And for now, I wanna turn it over to Valerie Overton, the Chair of Communications for Lexi see her to do a proper introduction of our fabulous guest. Great. Thank you, Jesse. So we are all so excited about this presentation. Um, as Jesse mentioned, Lexi Her is working to establish a woman's monument in Lexington. And the proposed monument will feature more than 20 Lexington women who made history, and one of whom is famed astrophysicist Cecilia Payne-Kapashkin. Cecilia began her career with the discovery that the sun and stars are composed of hydrogen and helium, much to the consternation and disapproval of the other scientists of the day who uh, believed the prevailing theory that the sun is made of the same materials as Earth. Cecilia continued to be a trailblazer throughout her career while raising a family here in Lexington. And so today we are honored to have Cecilia Payne Kapashkin's granddaughter here to talk about her grandmother's work and life. Cecilia Kapashkin is a historian of the Middle Ages. She received her PhD from Berkeley in 2001. She's now professor of history and chair of the Department of History at Dartmouth College, where she has taught since 2000. She is the author of several books, mostly dealing with medieval France, the history of the Crusades, and other themes in religious and cultural history. She teaches courses on medieval and early modern Europe, the Crusades, medieval religious history, and art and culture in the Middle Ages. And she continues to visit Lexington regularly as her family members still live here. Welcome, Dr. Cecilia Kapashkin. Thanks so much for that very, very nice introduction, Valerie. Um, uh, I am zooming in here from Hanover, New Hampshire, uh, about two hours north to east, uh, I guess northwest of Lexington. I know because I make the drive with some frequency um, and I still have frequent occasion to return to, to Lexington. And I just, I, it's, I'm speaking into a screen, so you never quite know who's there, but I'll just say to anybody who um, spends much time at Cary is that I spent most of my high school years in Cary Library uh, in the afternoons after school. So um, I am going to share my screen in this kind of funky way that is going to permit me to kind of be a, talking head. Okay, does that work? Is every Okay, yep, great, thanks. So as Valerie uh, so kindly introduced me, I'm a, a medieval historian and I teach in the history department at, in, at Dartmouth. Uh, more importantly, for the purposes of today's talk, I'm the granddaughter of Cecilia Pengaposhkin. Um, this is my mother's father. I'm sorry, my father's mother. So I, I'm her granddaughter through my dad. And uh, Panka Poshkin is among the 20, I think it's 20, extraordinary women uh, that the women of Lexington, that the Lex See Her Committee are currently advocating to honor on a monument in Lexington Center. And let me see, there we go. Um, this is the mock-up that I pulled from the web. And my understanding 
of the monument they want is that she will be represented in the in the seven place here I see I think Jesse um, uh, is nodding so that's good um, so she lived in Lexington where as I said I grew up for the better part of 45 years uh, from about the year 1935 up until her death in 1979 um, she was indeed an extraordinary woman among other things she was one of the most important astronomers of the 20th century and you might Remember that was the century of like Einstein and uh, Eddington, and you know these are the great lights. And I think any current textbook would put her among them. The first line in her Wikipedia uh, entry reads: "Cecilia Helena Penga Poshkin was a British-born American astronomer and astrophysicist who proposed in her 1925 doctoral thesis. So we're almost about a century ago." that stars were composed primarily of hydrogen and helium. That is her PhD work, which she com completed by the time she was 25. And I, this is a bit humbling in that I was on time with my PhD and finished at 31. So at the tender age of 25, she had already established that the chemical element of hydrogen was the most common element in the universe. And I want you to just think about it in these terms, which is that for all intents and purposes, at the age of 25, she discovered the nature of the universe, <laughs> composition of the universe. So that's one of those great like dorm room uh, conundrum questions, uh, which she got really got her hands around. No small feat. Uh, among her other claims to fame, uh, she was the first tenured woman at Harvard. Um, and she is increasingly pioneered for, uh, I'm sorry, she's increasingly revered as one of those pioneering women in, uh, in the history of science, so along with figures like Marie Curie, uh, as, as women out of their time or ahead of their time. And I've heard it said more than once that had she been a man, she would have won a Nobel Prize, right? So if you do a Google search on her, you get images like this, uh, this one. This one I think is not so true anymore. I hope she's increasingly uh, I mean, I know she's been increasingly uh, incorporated into the broader history of science, not as a token woman, but as a, as a, a, a trailblazer. Um, she's got a bit of a following. She's been monetized in t-shirts and mugs. Um, and this is my favorite one. She's made it onto a pack of playing cards of, of extraordinary woman, women along with uh, Ruth Gator Ginsburg and Hillary Clinton and the rest. So let me begin by saying that um, she died when I was nine. So 1979, here's a picture of us a few years earlier. Uh, I'm what, about three or four there. So probably about five or six years before she died. And so my memories of her are primarily the memories of a, of, you know, a granddaughter of a young girl of her grandmother. I remember her uh, very clearly sitting on that uh, on that sunken couch, uh, kind of a musty house. I remember her doing needlework. I'm going to show you an image of that. Um, this is a piece that she did that kind of looks like a weird piece of modern art in, in needlework. It's actually a, um, a needlepoint rendering of the, uh, the Cassiopeia supernova that she had been studying at the time. Um, I remember Sunday dinners. I remember papers all over the desk. Her grandchildren, we called her Midika or Mide, which was a term she chose for to be called familiarly. It's the Scottish term for, for mother. My point is, is that my, my direct memories of her are as a grandmother, not as the kind of remarkable woman whom I've gotten to know uh, as an academic, as an adult, as an intellectual. Um, and kind of a, a real role model for me uh, in a lot of ways about what it means to follow your passion, um, stay true to oneself, and understand that the value of intellectual life is really in one's own interest uh, rather than uh, the accoutrements around you. So my goal for the next 25, 30 minutes or so is really just to introduce you um, to this remarkable woman. Okay. Cecilia Payne Gaposhkin was born here in this house on May 10th, 1900. Um, and I know it because it was recently on the market and it was sold by tying it to her memory in England. So this is in uh, Wendover uh, outside London, uh, 1900. So Queen Victoria was on the throne. This is how people dressed and this is how they got around. 
um, she was one of three children, uh, two boys, I'm sorry, two girls and a boy. And it was a moderately well-off family and that her father was a historian and a lawyer. I think I get it from there maybe. Um, but uh, tragically, she died, he died when she was just four, four years old. And predictably the family finances became more uh, difficult, more tricky. Um, and the education of her brother Humphrey was considered uh, preeminent. And in fact, Humphrey Payne became a very important classical archeologist, uh, an expert in Greek pottery and head of the British School in Athens. And this matters in my household because I'm actually married to a classicist. Um, in fact, all three of the children were really uh, accomplished. Her sister was an extremely well-reputed architect. But anyway, back to 1904-05, money was uh, tight, but education was really considered paramount. Cecilia was clearly precocious. Uh, from an early age, it was clear that she was immensely talented academically and also musically. By the age of 10 or so, she knew French and German fluently, and she would use these for the remainder of her life. She had also mastered uh, the basics of Greek and Latin, and apparently her violin playing was so good that in high school, she was encouraged to pursue that and become a musician and a conductor. In her autobiography, uh, Cecilia discusses the extremely careful education she received at the primary school in Wendover, a program of study that would actually horrify modern teaching specialists or really modern educators. Memory and memorialization was really, uh, it was built on, on memorialization and a kind of obsessive dedication to observation. And these were the skills that were drilled um, incessantly in, at grade school. At a later age, she could recite every word of poetry that she had learned by heart from the age of 10. Modern grade school teachers would be horrified by this program of study, but she talks about her early education with enormous gratitude. A very good memory, she would later recall, has always been one of my assets, and I believe that I owe it entirely to this early training. So these are her memoirs uh, that have been published and republished. Um, and in them, she remembers with immense nostalgia her early discovery or love of, of science, her, her, her discovery of, of the idea of science, which began in fact quite early on with a, a discovery of nature. And she talks about walking in the woods and her sort of wonder at uh, the natural world. And so quite early on in life, she determined that she would become a botanist. And she remembers, this is one of my favorite tidbits in the book. She remembers worrying, this is like worrying that by the time she grew up, there would be nothing left to discover, that everything will have been discovered and that she needed to hurry up and get to the point that she could be a scientist. What was clear was that no one really much thought she should become a scientist, that it somehow wasn't practical or even really that it wasn't appropriate for a, a girl. The instruction that she received at her school, which is a girl's school, sacrificed science to the study of religion. This was a trade-off that she didn't much appreciate. And I wanna read you here one exchange that she remembered from the period. Um, she writes, or she wrote, the sense of living in a man's world continued to oppress me. Why, I asked Miss Edwards. Miss Edwards was a beloved early teacher that seemed that said stayed with her. Why, I asked Miss Edwards, was Jesus a man and not a woman? because in his day, she replied, a woman could not have done the things he had to do. But I did not find this convincing. Her desire to pursue what was clearly understood as a man's path was not encouraged at this stage. At the age of 12, as she left one school for another, the headmistress told her that she was prostituting her gifts, right, that's a quote, prostituting her gifts, to wish to go into science. So she became something of an autodidact. She found old copies of different scientific treaties and copied them out by hand. Um, at the age of 14 or 15, she laboriously read through a German version of Newton's Principia and translated it, transcribed it and translated it out by hand in order to learn it. At home, driven by her desire to become a botanical scientist, she began to collect plants. And then following up on the suggestion of, of one teacher, she began to draw them. This was part of that early training and observation. And I wanna show you some of the drawings that she did later in life. 
um, you can see she was immensely talented. She clearly had great artistic skill. But you can also see here uh, that the, the careful, the care in observing in order to see and record in order to, to really understand the, the, the sort of nature of careful observation being something that she, she prized and prioritized. She would later come to understand that capacity to observe and to see in order to understand as being the foundation of her own scientific method. But at the age of 15, she often had great contempt for her teachers who were clearly not as smart as she was. And there's one verse that she wrote, obviously in frustration, I would die if I found somebody had written something like this about me. Out on you, O oh fond instructor, perverter of nature's laws, explaining cause by effect and confounding effect with cause. I could say a thousand things about you, but I will desist, for you are a charming woman, but you are not a scientist. So this was the state of things until um, at 17, she got a scholarship and she was able to matriculate at a uh, place in London, St. Paul's School for Girls, which was a very uh, well-resourced, prestigious private school in central London. And this was really the game-changing moment for her, a school that had laboratories, that uh, wanted her to learn science, that had actually competent teachers. And she was finally given a capacity and a learning environment that fed her her passion and her interests. After a year at St. Paul, she applied to Newnham College in Cambridge in England. Um, here I am with my, my mother and my father. This is her son, Celia's son. We visited Newnham a few years ago. Uh, she matriculated in 1919. So this is just after the First World War had ended, optimism abounded. Uh, at Cambridge, this world opened up before her. And again, writing her memoir 60 years later, you can still feel the memory of her, her excitement and delight at, at these years. She went naturally, as she had said earlier, with the intention of studying biology and botany, but contact and just going to the lectures of Sir Arthur Eddington, uh, who's a great British uh, mathematician and, and, and physicist, um, was going to his lectures shifted her interest to physics and astronomy. To the end of her day, she considered Eddington to be the greatest intellect she had ever known. Newnham, that women's college, had set up separate lab spaces for women because they weren't allowed to go into the men's lab. The worry is that they would distract the men. Um, and she learned here, this is an old photo I got out of the archives at Newnham, um, uh, that a um, laboratory had been donated for, the, for women, a small little observatory rather had been donated to Newnham. And she uh, went out, she sort of dusted it off and began to look out into the skies to observe the stars. It's still on Newnham's ground. I went to visit it a few years ago. This is the telescope with which she first peered into, uh, into the skies. Um, and uh, this is the building that was recently renovated uh, in her honor. Um, so this was an important moment, but it was still something of an uphill battle to be a woman studying the sciences in 1918, um, sorry, 1919. She was permitted to study it, but she remembers being the only woman in one advanced physics course where she was made by the professor to sit in the front row. This was the, Erne, uh, the eminent Ernest Rutherford, that would be Lord Rutherford, um, who uh, she remembers would sardonically begin, ladies and gentlemen, to emphasize the point that she was the only lady there. The experience so humiliated her that for the rest of the life, she, her, the rest of her life, she would always sit in the back row of any lecture hall. When she spoke of her desire to become an astronomer to the director of the Solar Physics Observatory, this is a man named Frederick John Marion Stratton, he told her, quote, you can never hope to be anything but an amateur. So again, there was not a lot of encouragement to, to be had for her professionalization. But it was Eddington, Arthur Eddington himself, who had given her the encouragement she needed. In her first accidental face-to-face one-on-one encounter with Eddington, she remembers, did I get this? Let me see. Oh, no. She remembers, uh, uh, well, she, she, she writes, the moment had come and I wasted no time. I blurted out that I should like to be an astronomer. Was it then or was it later that he made the reply that was to sustain me through many rebuffs? Well, I can see no insuperable objection, he replied. And sometimes, of course, that kind of encouragement is all that it takes. 
So at Cambridge, she could study physics and chemistry, but she couldn't actually earn a degree in it. Now, this outrages me. Apparently, Cambridge didn't even award degrees to women until 1948. Obviously, for her, that was something of a technicality in terms of her undergraduate education, but there was absolutely no question of her doing graduate study at Cambridge. Women were simply not permitted into that curriculum. And so for that, she would have to go to America. And so she went. Initially, for just one year, on a fellowship to work at the Harvard Observatory, and then she ended up staying a lifetime. The Harvard Observatory she arrived at was, in fact, unlike where she had come from, filled with women. The observatory employed women as computers, right? Uh, this is obviously before the, the age, really, the invention of the computer as we know it. The image that I'm showing you here is uh, Henry Pickering, who is the director of the observatory, this guy with, I don't know if you can see my cursor, this guy with the, the funny haircut, and his, his computers, right, his counters. Uh, a number of these women were, are remembered as extremely competent, talented astronomers in their own right. And among them were women like Annie Jump Cannon and Henrietta Swan Leavitt, who were um, you know, both have impressive uh, histories of their own for their work. Um, my grandmother was actually given uh, Leavitt's desk when she arrived. These women were capable, they were competent, and they were cheap. Pickering used to measure the cost of certain projects he wanted to undertake in terms of girl hours. So it is at this stage that Cecilia Payne Poshkin really made the transformation from being a student who mastered the textbook, right, who transcribed everything out and mastered what was known from a student to a scholar when she began to think about those things that we did not yet know and how to learn them, how to figure out, how to learn new knowledge. And this was at Harvard in the 1920s. And she began to exploit uh, developing a sort of current methods or, or techniques in spectroscopy to analyze and interpret the photographic evidence that was collected about the stars. So what is spectroscopy? Here, I mean, I have to admit, I'm really getting out of my, <laughs> my comfort zone. But as I understand it, or as you know, Wikipedia tells me, it's a, a method of assessing or ascertaining the nature and makeup or substance and matter through the dispersing of a light wave through a prism. In 1922 or so, the photographic evidence of the stars, which is how people knew about them, looked like this, this sort of grainy photograph. And when it was photographed through a spectrum, um, this is what you got. This is actually one of my grandmother's slides. To work with this kind of data, the ability to see, right, to observe, to actually understand what you were looking at was the thing that was utterly critical because of course there were no computers. The women were the computers. There were no algorithms. The computers were the women of the observatory. After the year's fellowship was up, Cecilia basically just stayed on at the Harvard Observatory. There was no formal PhD program in astronomy yet at Harvard, but the director of the observatory was ambitious and he wanted to set up a program. So he organized that she would matriculate as a graduate student at Harvard. It wasn't unclear whether it was in the physics department or what, but she, she matriculated as a graduate student and she simply just continued on with the work that she had started the year before. When she had completed one segment of work, she wrote it up in the form of a book called Stellar Atmospheres, which was ultimately published as um, Harvard monograph number one, and for it she was granted a PhD. This was, in fact, the first PhD that Harvard granted in astronomy, and the year was 1925, which you can see down there. Okay, let us talk about this PhD. It is considered the most PhD, the most important PhD ever written in the field of astronomy. Um, and because I really am out here, I'm going to outsource this to a YouTube clip that I found uh, pretty pretty clear. And so, uh, Matt, were you going to um, pull that up for me? Yep. I'll Thanks. share that now. You can see that, correct? Yep. All right. There was a time not long ago when everyone thought that the planets and the stars were all made of the same stuff as Earth, the same elements and compounds, all in the same proportions. This was also a time when we thought we had invented the best possible tools to observe stars and planets in close detail. But it turned out we were wrong. It wasn't until 1925 that a young astronomy student found the key to observing what was really out there, and she changed the way we look at the universe in more ways than one. 
Cecilia Payne was born in England in 1900, not a time when women were welcome in the world of science. But she was smart and passionate and pursued her true love, astronomy. In 1923, Payne emigrated to the U.S. to study at Radcliffe College, now Harvard College Observatory, one of the only academic institutions at the time that accepted female students in the discipline of physics. And in just two years, she became the first person to earn a PhD at the college with what's been called the most brilliant thesis ever written in astronomy. In it, 23-year-old Payne laid the groundwork for basically everything we know about the stars. And for the first time, she corrected our assumption that the whole universe shares Earth's elemental makeup. Before Payne, everyone assumed that the stars were made of basically the same hundred or so elements found on Earth. It stood to reason at the time that the stuff we know here must be the same as the stuff out there. But once we started to use spectrographs, tools that allow us to read the elements in the stars, the universe started to look confusing. Spectrography was first developed in the late 19th century when scientists realized that if they passed light through a medium like a gas and broke it into a spectrum, certain wavelengths of color would be missing from that spectrum. After doing this enough, they were able to tell which elements absorbed which wavelengths, and the science of spectrography was born. This was clearly useful for observing the elements in the atmospheres of stars, a medium that lay between us and the constant source of starlight. And it appeared that the stars tended to have all the same elements as Earth in more or less the same proportions. But soon, a weird pattern emerged. The spectra from all known stars consistently formed seven different absorption sequences. This seemed to suggest that there were seven kinds of stars, each composed of the same hundred odd elements as Earth, but with some slight variations. But why would there only be seven different types of stars when there are more than a million possible combinations of those hundred or so elements? It just didn't add up and no one had a good explanation. But Payne suspected that we were looking at the problem in the wrong way. She hypothesized that the seven spectrum patterns we were seeing weren't the result of different combinations of elements, but they were created by seven different temperature ranges. How could that be? Well, in matter, atoms are normally swarming around each other and colliding. The higher the temperature is, the more atoms move around and the more collisions there are. And in really exceedingly high temperatures, sometimes atoms can collide so fast that one of their electrons will essentially break off, creating an ion of that atom. So for example, if an atom of helium, which typically has two electrons, is in one of these high temperature mosh pits and it loses one of its electrons, it'll turn into a helium ion. So now, because they have new, slightly different chemical signatures, these ions absorb different wavelengths of light than their parent electrons. Elements do. Payne hypothesized that since hotter temperatures mean more ionization, that could explain the different absorption patterns that astronomers were finding. But then the question was, ions of what? She went about determining which ions could create those mysterious absorption patterns and at what temperature range they could each exist. That could have taken forever because Payne was dealing with not just that original hundred odd elements, but also countless variations of each. But as soon as she began studying ions of hydrogen, everything fell into place. The seven different spectrograph patterns created by starlight perfectly corresponded to those made by seven groups of hydrogen ions, each of which could only exist in its own temperature range. After identifying those groups, Payne was able to study other ions that could also exist at those temperatures and determine which ones could make the spectral patterns that everyone was seeing. The thing was, most of what could be found in those lines were ions of helium, but not much else. For the first time, it was clear that the stars were not made of the same elements as Earth, but overwhelmingly of just the two lightest elements hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen, Payne realized, was about one million times more abundant than any other element in the stars. And from this new understanding, scientists were able to form all sorts of new theories that address some of the biggest issues in the cosmos. Like that the universe was originally made of hydrogen, and then the stars created heavier atoms by fusing hydrogen atoms together and the heavier elements that followed. Payne's research made it possible to read the histories of stars by knowing not only their chemical makeup, but their temperatures and densities too. Still, it was 1925, and Cecilia Payne was a woman. Her advisor urged her not to publish her findings in her thesis because they were too controversial. One professor said they were clearly impossible. Regrettably, she took their advice. But then a few years later, her advisor published the same results that Payne first discovered and presented to him and is still sometimes credited with her work to this day. That's, that's where you want me to stop, right? Yep, that's perfect. So who followed that? I sort of kind of follow it. Remember, I'm a historian. Um, I did want to learn what an ion was. I just, I just have to say, I would just during the video, I was going to through to see the, the participants and I see Martha Wood is on the call and um, Suzanne Rosenberg, if that's my old friend from high school, Suzanne Rosenberg, just send, shoot me an email because that would be super fun and uh, gratifying. Okay, so let me pull back up the screen that I was uh, working with. And let's get us back to where we were. Uh, bear with me, we got that. 
where are we? We are, we're in 1925 and we have now published, um, published our extraordinary, I mean, she's published our extraordinary issue. The presenter here, that lovely young presenter, uh, uh, is actually wrong that uh, in saying that Henry Norris Russell was her advisor. He wasn't technically uh, so, that was Harlow Shapley. He, uh, Russell taught at Princeton, and of course she was at Harvard. But uh, she is not wrong that her advisor, Shapley, discouraged her from publishing her thesis. The result was in part that the findings that the sun and the stars in the universe were mostly hydrogen went so against conventional wisdom that her advisors and her seniors were just skeptical of her results and were cautious. And she was discouraged from publishing them at that stage. But within a decade, she was actually proven correct. We, me, in hearing this story are absolutely furious at her advisors. But in her memoir, she actually takes herself to task for not sticking to her guns. Um, she says, it was I, I was to blame for not having pressed my point. I had given in to authority when I believed I was right. That is another example of how not to do research. I note it here as a warning to the young. If you are sure of your facts, you should defend your position. Before we move on, I have to stop and show you this picture just to show you that they did have some fun. Uh, brilliance doesn't need to be monastic. Um, this is a kind of astronomical play that they were putting on in at the Harvard College Observatory in the 1920s. And there she is right here um, playing a role. So I don't know what it was, uh, but it looks like they were they were having fun. Anyhow, after 25, Cecilia then stayed on at the observatory in a permanent but in a technical capacity to work just to continue the work she was doing. When Cecilia was about 30 years old, uh, she fell in love. This was for the first time and it didn't go well and her heart was utterly broken and somewhat despondent. And in order to kind of take her mind off things, she decided to to take a trip, to go on a travel, to kind of get away, go back to Europe, in fact, for a, a mind. Though she didn't have a formal faculty position at Harvard, she did have quite a reputation as a fine astronomer. At one point, actually Edward Hubble, you know that name, that's the Hubble telescope is named after him. At one point, uh, Hubble jokingly called her the best man at Harvard among the astronomers. Astronomer colleagues the world over knew her work. And so she organized to go and visit a series of important observatories and talk with some of the leader, leading astronomers in uh, Northern Europe. As part of this trip, she was invited to, the, to visit the observatory in Pulkova in the Soviet Union. This was of a, you know, by a Russian colleague. And so she went for 11 days in July of 1933. So you have to remember this is Stalinist Rus Russia and the Soviet Union was in the middle of an enormously devastating famine engineered by Stalin as part of his five-year plan, uh, plan. And the trip, for, uh, for Cecilia was appalling and it was a deeply moving experience which she recorded in this diary, this travel diary, um, which is a super interesting document for, for the historian. Anyway, from there, uh, sort of collecting her grips about her and clearly shaken to the core from her experience, she went to a series of international meetings of the Astronomical Society, which she had planned the trip around, that was taking that place, uh, taking place that year in Göttingen in Germany. Now, if you Google Germany in 1933, this is what you get. This is what Wikipedia gives you. It was a tense time to say the least, um, and for many quite horrifying. Adolf Hitler had been appointed chancellor on January 30th of 33, and he declared the Third Reich on March 15th. At that conference in August, Cecilia met a Russian emigre astronomer named Sergei Gaposhkin. Incidentally, um, it was around this time that Sergei met my other grandfather in Berlin, laying the seeds for my parents ultimately meeting 30 years later. Anyway, Sergei was a uh, Russian who's from the Crimea living in Germany and he couldn't get back home. Um, and he was of course in the thirties desperate to get out of, of Germany as a, it was not a good time to be a stateless Russia, Russian living in uh, Nazi Germany. After the conference, I mean, Cecilia was clearly very moved in meeting him. And when she got back to the state, she went into full gear to get Sergei to America. 
She traveled to Washington uh, to get him papers. She cashed in whatever social capital she had at Harvard to get him work there. He was ultimately employed at Harvard as the Harvard astronomer. And he arrived uh, to the States eight months later, and then they were married just a few months after that. It is at this point that she became pain Gaposchkin, and this would be an early foray into hyphenation because of course she had published, she had a reputation as pain already as an astronomer. Here's a picture of them early in their marriage. Um, it's around this time that they bought a house in on Shade Street in Lexington, the house that I remember my Sunday evening dinners at. They sometimes collaborated on work. They had three children um, uh, in fairly quick succession. First, my father, uh, Edward Michael, then my aunt Catherine here on the left, and then in time, my uncle Peter. Um, let me just say what to me is obvious in, in the academic world, that it's hard to be a working mom. In the 1930s and 40s, it was totally unheard of to be an academic, a woman academic, a woman scientist, and a mother. I mean, I don't, there aren't other examples of it. So let's get back to her professional trajectory. From 1925 until her death in 1979, she continued on this path of inquiry and discovery. As I said, she was employed at Harvard College's observatory in a permanent position, but not as a faculty member. She did some teaching and she became the editor of the Harvard Astronomical Publications, which she would later credit with her ability to write so clearly. She wasn't given a prestigious position, nor one that had obvious capacities for financial or professional advancement, but it wasn't so clear that she understood this or cared that much because she was always grateful that she had been able to do the work that she loved in the first place that wouldn't have been possible in England. It wasn't until many years later in 1952, when she was 52 years old, that things were set right. She would later describe this as, quote, the advancement that was finally accorded to me. An astronomer, and um, Donald Menzel, uh, who had been long kind of a, a competitor and a rival, uh, who was trained by Norris Russell at Princeton, was uh, made director of the Harvard Observatory, a position that wasn't open to her because of her sex. The new director, when he got there, was shocked to learn how little she was being paid, and her salary was overnight doubled, just, of course, for being given a proper title for the work that she had been doing. And she was then in time given a proper faculty position at Harvard. In the end, she was the first woman to receive tenure in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences through the ranks and was later the first woman to be made full professor uh, and ultimately chair of the astronomy department. That isn't so much of an accolade, I can promise you as chair of my own department, it's more of um, a chore. But she was given and accorded the respect that came with that. At that moment in 1952 was probably the most obvious point of professional recognition for her. In the American Academy in 1952, it was still extremely rare. She was not a fussy woman. And I think it was with some satisfaction as she grew into her 60s and 70s that she was increasingly appreciated for her pioneering role in astronomy and scientific advances. Although she was primarily celebrated, as you saw in that video earlier, for the work that she published in 1925, she continued to do important astronomical work throughout her life. Henry Norris Russell ultimately would acknowledge her contribution, although, as you heard, the groundbreaking implications of her doctoral work are still sometimes credited to him. But time can mend. Harvard itself has been increasingly proud to have Payne Gaposchkin associated with its history. In 2002, a formal portrait of her was commissioned and hung in the faculty room at the University Hall at Harvard, partly, I was joked as, as was joked at the time, this was an affirmative, active, an affirmative action portrait um, because there was only one other woman. And this was, I just have to say this, of a, of a woman named Helen Maud Cam, who was the other early tenured faculty woman who was a medieval historian. <laughs> so, the two people in, uh, in University Hall are um, Cecilia Pinkaposhi and Helen Modcam. That pleases me greatly. Okay, so what do I take from my grandmother's legacy? I'm told I have her nose. That was my father told me I had her nose. My undergraduate advisor at the University of Michigan who had studied with Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin at Harvard said that I looked like her. I obviously wish I had her intellect. Sitting where I sit in academia as a historian who understands something about historical change, I'm beyond amazed at what she was able to accomplish in her field at the time as a woman, as a scientist, and as a mother. That's just extraordinary to me. 
for me personally, and this is a lesson that I try to talk about with my own students and my kids, um, she represents for me a kind of twin lesson in passion and patience. Pink Kaposchkin would often say to women who wish to enter a scientific career that they should undertake it if nothing else would satisfy them because nothing else would they get. This is the um, quote on this mug that you can buy for $22. Um, I think this has changed actually, and that's a good thing, obviously. Um, when I lecture and I give versions of this lecture to high school women often, I try to hold her up as an example of what it means really to commit to a passion. And then the great gift of getting to follow that passion into a, a, a work of, of um, you know, a, a life's work and a career and to, to be paid for it. I think she's a wonderful credit to Lexington where she lived for more than half her life and a wonderful example to be celebrated for Lexington's future women and as importantly, the husbands, fathers, brothers and sons who should support them in their dreams and the role that they can play in the making of life and history. Thank you. And I will unshare, stop sharing. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Cecilia. And I have to say that was just a wonderful, wonderful presentation, really quite fascinating and has, you know, given me a lot more insight into her, um, even though I've kind of been studying her for a while. Um, and I too am a scientist. And so yeah. to me, like, I, I just love the history of science. And the unknown, largely unknown roles that women have played in, in the history of science. And it strikes me as you were presenting that, um, that, you know, in a different time, in a different place where women were held in uh, higher regard, shall we say, <laughs> that she might've been called like a Renaissance man or a Renaissance woman. Mm -hmm because she had, she was so multi-talented. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I think she can be called, I mean, it's just not something that we a attach to, uh, to women, but absolutely. She did have this early capacity. I mean, apparently she was an extraordinarily good violinist. Um, I remember, I either remember it or have been told it and it's become one of my memories, you know how that happens, mm -hmm. that in bed, you know, she died of cancer, of lung cancer, she smoked. Um, and uh, uh, hence the musty house, right? But that in bed, she'd be sitting up in bed playing, playing violin. So that stayed with her to the end of her life. And um, uh, I mean, and I, and the, I mean, her Latin, I'm sure is better than mine. And I use mine every day, you know, I mean, that kind of early training, but I think she really was of an extraordinary capacity. One of the things, um, and here I'm just drawing on a, another hat that I, I wear, but in trying to talk with students here at Dartmouth about what liberal education is, liberal arts education is, and the capacity to excel in different fields, a, a very useful article I came across a number of years ago is the fact that um, there's a study of, of um, the truly great scientists that like Nobel Prize winners and the people elected to the American Academy of Arts and Science tend to, the great scientists tend to have what we would call an art whether they painted or they did music or they were great readers of literature or writers of poetry, a sort of serious um, commitment to a creative and what we would call humanistic uh, kind of capacity of exploration that tends to go with the really open mind that is really has that capacity to make and understand those discoveries. So, and that would be a Renaissance. I mean, that would be the Renaissance the instinct of the Renaissance lettered. Man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it strikes me that that is that kind of mind mm -hmm. that is, you know, open. And to me, it's just astounding at that time for her to have an open mind sufficient to consider a completely different um, uh, uh, thought of way of of pursuing the composition of the sun and stars. I mean, that, that is really, it's hard to describe nowadays if you don't have that history of science, just how profoundly revolutionary that was. Um, we do have a, um, a question in the chat and, and I, I think that what, 
the way I think about this is that she was so multi-talented. Mm -hmm. Like, how did she choose astronomy as opposed to like botany and the arts? And, you know, she just had so many paths that she yeah. might have taken. So again, I mean, the best guide or the best answer to this is that I know is um, uh, her autobiography, where she talks really about the transformative effect of having listened to Eddington's lectures. Mm -hmm. Eddington had just come, it's been a while since I read this, so I'm going to, I hope I'm not going to get it wrong, but he had just come back from, I think it's South America, from one of the um, uh, observations to watch one of the eclipses and they were this was in the within the scope or within the sort of context of the Einstein's great discoveries and his, his beginning and Edding and he was doing a series of, of Eddington was doing a series of experiments to um, kind of validate verify or practically uh, kind of observe Einstein's theoretical um, conclusions. I, um, Eddington was a great popularizer. I mean, among he was a he was a research. He wasn't just a popularizer, but he had a capacity to translate uh, sort of the the kind of thinking, the kind of advances that Einstein and his group were going. So he came back from this 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 trip, and he gave a lecture um, that Cecilia attended. And really, I mean, she describes it as blowing her mind. And I think she talks about having like two frenzied sleepless nights of of kind of um, uh, revelation, essentially. Um, now, I will say, I you know, when I read her autobiography, I mean, there are two really good sources for this. The one is her autobiography. The other is a biography uh, written by Sylvia Boyd of both her and my grandfather, who is an interesting figure in his own right, which um, I hope Carrie Library has a copy of um, and is is worth reading. Very uh, uh, clear. Uh, exposition of, of her life. Um, I, when I read her autobiography, it does have a lot of nostalgia attached to it. Um, and so I do wonder how much of it, I mean, this is the historian who comes to sources critically and thinks about reading against the grain, wonders what the actual experience will be like. But the testimony of her peers that has been taken in her lifetime is, is pretty, um, you know, supportive of that really amazing heady period of, of discovery in the early 20s. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, that makes so much sense. There is something so exhilarating um, about that kind of just opening of discovery. Um, I see it, a series uh, of, I don't know how we want to moderate this, I see a series of questions in the chat which I may or may mm -hmm. not be able to address or I don't know. Yeah, I've been kind of weaving the questions in. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so, uh, so a couple of uh, questions. Uh, one is, you know, I, I love kind of her description of kind of meeting passion and patience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I guess I would add, you know, that there has to be some strength of will to kind of maintain some kind of life, some type of energy against all of the discouragements, you know, that, you know, came across her. And a lot of times people seek community with other women or role models, and there weren't a lot of those. And so I'm wondering, you know, if through her papers or family lore, you know, you have any insights into how she managed that? Yeah, I don't. I mean, I my mom is on this call. My mother knew her again quite well as an adult. I wish she could weigh in here um, because she again had an adult relationship with her and observed her in in that way. In that way, I know that you know she. Um, I remember, you know, I remember garden parties uh, at their house. I mean, I think she was a member of the faculty. You know, the, the faculty in her college community observatory. I think was very important to her. She was a member of the um, Anglican Church or the Episcopal, I think the Episcopalian Church in Lexington Center. Um, you know, so I, I think she she had a family life and a, mm -hmm. but the strength of will, I mean, again, I can't even begin to imagine it. Um, and I only, it only, I only make sense of it by the, that's the wrong way to put it, her, her, just the clarity of her of her capacity to it to you know her interest her 
just mm -hmm. your, I mean, again, passion is an overused word, but that kind of driving need to to do the work. And again, I you know the thing that I appreciate about her is her um, her commitment to the work rather than the profession, which mm -hmm. means or the work rather than the career. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's you know as we're I teach at an elite college, there's a lot of concern about. Um, status and and uh, career building and and I think as I read her story the thing that sustained her was her interest in in the work not the trappings of the success that came with it the the reward was the intellectual discovery the success of of doing the work properly and finding mm -hmm. it out not being and I'm I'm sure she was gratified by the accolades uh, and the acknowledgement and I mean as she should be. <laughs> Um, I am so grateful to the director of the observatory for his recognition of how absurd it was that she was employed as a technician. I just, I have, I'm sure I met him as a child. I have untold gratitude towards him for that. <laughs> but I think for her, it really was a, the notion of what she was meant to do. Great, yeah. So I'll ask one uh, last question as a segue mm -hmm. to Jesse. Um, yeah kind of wrapping us up and is a question from Jesse. It's, a, you know, how lovely to be able to read her journal oh, yeah. to learn about her experiences in Europe and how does your family maintain her papers? <laughs> and well, how I, have, does it... <laughs> I have a box up there that you can't quite see that's filled with some of them. Harvard has most of them, um, you know, as they should. So her academic papers and her working papers. Um, that diary, I mean, her, by diary, it's not like a personal journal. It really is a like, I went here on this day, I went here on this day, but there are some, because it was combined with the her work, it was very much a, a record, a travel log. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a really important, um, and I've scanned it and I keep trying to, I keep thinking I'll get a student to work on it at some point, um, just transcribe it. Um, and at some point it'll go into some archive. Uh, but um, no, she was fairly careful about you know, and she wrote, again, she wrote her autobiography in part because I think she wanted to control her own story, which is what mm -hmm. autobiographies are about. Um, it's interesting, this this moment of her falling in love at age 30. I asked a bunch of people if we knew who that was. Not a word, nobody knew, do you know what I mean? And so she, you know, she, I think she, she was English after all. <laughs> she was a Victorian <laughs> English lady. So there would have been some notion of propriety and, and of circumspection, I think, that again, as her granddaughter, we want to honor. Um, so. Yeah. Well, I, I could talk with you all day about this. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, I will hand it over to Jesse to wrap us up. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's just been oh, it's a delight. Real pleasure. And it's an honor. And I think it's a wonderful thing as a historian, not, you know, that what the Lexi Her Project is doing as, you know, a uh, long overdue appreciation of the of the women who have have nurtured the community so all right i'm turning it off no, thank, thank you very you. much for the invitation thank you so to, much to... cecilia and we wanted to show people for people who are curious about how cecilia will be portrayed in the monument um i'm just going to show you a couple pictures and i'm also putting the link places where people can learn more while I'm putting up the slide, I want to give a special shout out. I see in the list of people who are here, we have some um, some people who graduated from Lexington High School in the more recent years who are pursuing science and specifically astronomy or physics or astrophysics um, for their careers. Really glad you're here. And we know Professor McLeod's class at Wellesley is going to be watching from the observatory. Um, with a little bit of a delay because they're in class right now, but they're about to hop on. Um, okay, so just real quickly, want to show you, um, Cecilia had a picture up of the monument on the left here, which I'll show you a close up. On the right is Meredith Bergman. She's the sculptor. She's a nationally recognized sculptor. You may have heard her name because she recently, um, in 2003, designed the Boston Women's Memorial on Commonwealth Avenue. And in 2020, she has designed the first monument to recognize real women in Central Park in New York. The monument proposal she brought to Lexi her knocked our socks off because we had imagined we might be able to tell one, two or three stories perhaps. And instead she gave us this unique gate design. Again, I'll be zooming in closer. 
that allows us to bring forward more than 20 women's stories from across time. And I'm going in reverse for where we usually do, I'm going kind of backwards chronologically, but Cecilia will be shown here wearing graduation robes, which also represent the academic regalia that professors wear at graduation um, and becomes really symbolic. She's holding a telescope here, and I'll show you why in a moment that is so uh, cleverly designed by Meredith. Um, but it allows us to think about this broader theme of education in the development of women's place in America and the world, the more they learn and the more they can find that right fit that you talked about so beautifully. Where do you put your intellectual talents? Where do you find the companionship of other people who are interested in the ideas or professional area? So she stands back to back across time with Mary Elizabeth Miles Bibb Carey, who was the first black African-American woman to graduate from the normal school in Lexington. And her story is a whole separate talk, but she is holding in the same place where Cecilia has the telescope, Mary Elizabeth Miles is holding a rolled up scroll, which could represent either that graduation diploma or the fugitive, the voice of the fugitive, the newspaper that she and her husband published after they fled from America when the 1850 fugitive slave law passed. Again, it's a whole separate story, but Meredith's design has these women on both sides of the monument equally important. There's no front, there's no back, two fronts, and women across time. For example, one outline shows us a tea burner during the tea protest. Here in Lexington, people burned tea before they were tossing it off into the harbor in Boston. This form of protest, standing with a young woman from today who represents the way women pass on these stories of history that you as a professor at Dartmouth are doing exactly that with your professional career, passing on these stories because understanding our past really informs the way we see ourselves today and it changes what the future possibilities will be for all of us. I won't go through all the other stories, but there's other women standing back to back that really speak to the big event coming up here with Patriots Day, just a couple of weeks away. Obviously we're speaking to you today, Cecilia, in Women's History Month, um, mm -hmm. and women played a really important role as Patriots right here in Lexington. So here we have, um, on the left side, we have Margaret Tulip, who was a woman who lived here for 75 years during the 1700s and experienced life having been born to an enslaved woman. She was enslaved. She was eventually legally free, then taken against her will, re-enslaved and pursued her freedom in the courts. And she stands back to back with Anna Harrington, who was the woman who hosted a spinning protest in 1769. The plaza design has got a spinning wheel motif. You see a spinning wheel here in the design. And as you saw on that slide, each of these women are tied to this very important place. I have it in my screen behind me, um, which is the open lawn space right around here. Here's the battle green on the left and over on the right, you can see where the monument is proposed to go. It's a really nice, beautiful location, plenty of space here to fit women in and to tell our stories. I won't tell these other stories today, but we'll just leave people with the website, lexseeher.com and our email, lexmonument at gmail.com. So if you have questions or you want to get involved, we've got a fantastic research team that meets every week. We've been meeting for over a year, um, people who enjoy history and want to tell these stories. So I just want to thank you again, Cecilia. Your presentation was amazing. It just uh -huh. makes me want to read more. Um, and mm -hmm. the fact that you yourself, you know, grew up right here in Lexington and you were changing the world, helping more people understand history. It's really, it's exactly what we're talking about, the value of women comes out in so many ways. And last but not least, thank you to Cary Library for making this event something where we could see lots of people on uh, what is a sunny day at the end of winter as spring comes. Matt, thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse and Valerie. And thank you, Cecilia, again, for talking with us today. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.